Hello, everyone, and welcome to an episode of the Captain Bob Flight Sim Podcast. This is a podcast I run interviewing different people. I haven't really publicized this a lot on the YouTube channel, but I thought I'd put this episode up on the main channel so that you can get a piece of the action. This is going to be an interview with Evan Reiter, uh, the co-founder of Flight Sim Expo. So I really hope you enjoy this and let's get right into it. Today we have a very special guest, Evan Ryder from the Flight Sim Expo. He's one of the co-founders. So, uh, welcome to episode 10. I like to say that it's the big 1-0. And tell me a little bit about yourself, Evan. Yeah, thanks so much for having me and for featuring us here on the podcast. My name is Evan, as you mentioned. I've been a flight simmer for what feels like forever right now. I probably got started back in about 2007 when I was in high school, when I was at the time working on my private pilot license. Since then, I have grown up a little bit. I worked for the airlines now, flying the Embraer 175 for a company here in North America, and obviously a co-founder of Flight Sim Expo, which is the largest flight simulation trade show and conference that we do in North America. Excellent. And what what do you think was one of the things that got you into flight simulation? I think it was just I've been like fascinated by not just airplanes, but kind of anything that's moved for my whole life. I remember as a kid, I'd make my dad take me to like a railroad crossing. We would sit there and like a train would come by once every 15 minutes. And I was just super excited by that. So whether it's buses, trains, cars, and now airplanes, stuff that's moved has just always kind of been really interesting from the time I was young. And I think that's what kind of got me into aviation. And then aviation is what led me to flight simulation. I think I had done maybe like one intro flight at a local airport when I was 15 16 17 that kind of thing and then i discovered flight simulator i started in fsx and i started with the trial version on some super old desktop computer it took longer for the flight to load than it did to actually fly the flight and i remember doing that because there were like two missions that you could get for free in the demo version so i remember trying that juliana landing in the crj with like a mouse and keyboard trying to land the airplane like must have been hundreds of times and then finally my parents got me the actual full version for christmas and i was like wow i can actually like fly to other places now and so that's that's what got me to flight sim and then from there it was like online aviation and bat sim and bva and expo kind of all came as a result of really just one one fateful day when i discovered fsx existed i guess absolutely that sounds like a really cool story uh and i definitely think it was a lot earlier in the progression progression of flight simulation uh so i guess what are some of the things that you've really seen change that are I guess, hilarious changes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think about back when I started, right? You basically had maybe one or two choices for Yokes, which was like the CH Products one, or the SciTech at the time, I think came out a little bit after I started. And of course there was no YouTube really in terms of like live streaming the way we see it today. There was no Twitch. So you were really on your own. Like it was like forums and people posting screenshots and like occasionally people would post a video, but by nowhere close to what we see today in terms of technology. So I think both on the hardware side where we now see like just a huge variety of flight simulation controls, many of which will be on display at our show. I think that's really cool. And then just, you know, people like you, I mean, what content creators have been able to do for our industry in terms of giving us that lens into what other people are doing. So I remember for me, when I was flying my first few flights in Flight Simulator, it was like you were on TeamSpeak and you were talking to somebody and, you know, you might just discover something by accident. So I remember one day I was like, the way I thought that you navigated was that you put the GPS and programmed where you wanted to go. And then you used the heading bug and you just tried to keep it on the line in the GPS. And someone is like, no, there's actually a nav GPS switch you can use. And then it, it'll follow the GPS. And that was a really eye-opening experience for me. And so I remember just like catching up on these little things like that or reading forum posts. I mean, that's all there was. And now, you know, again, we have Discord, we have YouTube, we have Twitch. So to me, that's really cool. And then of course, you know, the last year of Microsoft Flight Simulator, what that's done for the community, we all, we all kind of know. So really cool to see now, here we are on Xbox and here we are across many different platforms, support for Linux and support for anything you can imagine, virtual reality, it's come into play. It doesn't doesn't feel like it's been 20 years of flights and, and it almost feels like just all of that stuff that I've mentioned kind of has happened in the last three or four years. So it's really exciting time to be in this industry. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, thank you for all the insight with that. Uh, we asked what you what kind of got you into flight simulation, but what really kept you going and what really kept you into flight simulation? 
it's always been online aviation for me. So when I talk to it, I talk to lots of people now through my work at Flight Simulation Association, lots of noob simmers, people in many cases who might be pilots who are like, how can I use this for training? And how can I use this to get my next certification or rating or whatever? And so when we talk with them, we're like, listen, the flight simulator itself is like one piece, but you have to think about online aviation, things like VATSIM or IVAO, flying with other people in multiplayer servers, doing dogfights, doing and carrier landings that to me is what the real value is that social aspect of being able to hang out in a discord or a team speak or a community with other people so you're not just flying on your own and that's what has gotten me into flights in much more than i think i ever would have if i was just flying single player and what's kept me there so i'm a controller on vatsim in the boston region as part of a group called boston virtual air tcc which has both pilots and controllers one of the few vatsim sort of sponsored groups that actually has pilots as members and and that group basically has been a huge part of my life. It helped me through getting my private pilot's license, and it spurred me to go to the airlines. And there's people that I've known on there for 20 years, and we've kind of grown up together from being kids and just like learning how to fly both in the sim and in real life to now many of us are working for the airlines. Some of us have gone on to become controllers with the FAA or other agencies, and that group has just been a huge part of my life. We just had a big get-together about uh, four or five days ago now in Nashua. We do this every year. Year, we go to the place where the real world Boston Center is and we actually do an event live from Nashua, New Hampshire. And so this like annual get together happens. There were I think 30 or 35 people there and uh, you know, it was just a, just a great experience for all of us. So for me, what's kept me in flight simulation by far is the community of people that I've kind of grown up with now it feels like and being able to do you know stuff like this, uh, whether it's flights Mexico related, FSA related or just VATSIM related. I think if you're able to bring people together and kind of build that social piece around flight sim, that's so important we sometimes think of ourselves as like computer nerds who are like hanging out by ourselves in the basement um, but but that's really not the truth at all we're always hanging out with other people it just may not be sometimes face to face that's excellent uh yeah i i heard a little bit about the boston atc um what do you think i know there's a lot of vat sim kind of uh shyness towards it it's like hitting up the radio button in real life but yeah i guess while we're on the subject what are some of the things that really keep people uh from going on vat sim and how would you kind of combat that well there first of all there should be basically nothing um and i'll caveat that by saying probably if you don't know how to fly your airplane or if it's your first day in the simulator or if you're maybe getting started on VATSIM and it's the busiest event of the year, those are not great times to get started. Uh, so if you know if you're somebody who is like brand new to it, I think there's certainly ways that you can you know get started better than others. But there's no reason to be shy. There's no reason to be afraid. As long as you put in a little bit of homework, this is you know something you can really do very easily. And as you pointed out, very much like in real life, the first time I was in an airplane. I was one of the few people who wasn't scared to talk to the controller, and that's because I had done it so much on Vatsim before. So we deal with that all the time, people who are like, I was super nervous and don't know who to talk to, or I'm worried about that. Most of the time, the people that you encounter on VATS and the controllers are hanging out in their pajamas. They may be drinking a soft drink or a beer or something like that, and they're just here for have fun, same as anybody else is. And so if you've done you know, a little bit of homework and you kind of understand how to fly your airplane, you can do basic things like hold headings and altitudes and navigate and maybe fly an instrument approach like an ILS, you pretty much have all you need to be able to get started. Then you do a little bit of reading on the VATSIM website where they explain which controller to talk to and they give you some information on the words to use. And after that, the rest you'll learn by doing. If you put your hand up and you say, hey, I'm new, I haven't flown a real airplane, I've never flown on the network before, let people know that, hey, this is something that's brand new to you, you'll encounter almost everybody who says, welcome, thanks for letting me know that you're new and, and how can I help you? If there's people who create challenges on VATSIM, they're the people who don't read or who aren't willing to take that time to do a little bit of homework. So they might come onto the network, maybe they've never even flown a flight simulator before that day, and they're like, I'm going to start learning on the network. You know, that's probably not the right way to go about doing it. But if you're somebody who's done a little bit of homework, you've done the reading, you're comfortable flying your airplane, now you really shouldn't be afraid of talking with air traffic control because they're just people like me. We're just hanging out in a TeamSpeak server talking and if you put your hand up and say i'm new by just simply saying on the frequency i'm a student pilot or if you put in your flight planner marks that you are a student pilot 
everyone who you talk to should be saying, hey, welcome to Vatsim. Great to have you here. And if you have questions, let me know. That's certainly how I am with new people. That's how the people I choose to hang around with are when it comes to new people. So if you're ever someone who's afraid, you know, don't be. Just do a little bit of that research and you'll be absolutely fine. And I'm more than happy to help. And there's lots of other people who you can reach out to. Of course, there's some fantastic content creators on Twitch that you can follow. And you can watch them both flying on Vatsim and controlling on Vatsim and all kinds of other resources you can find across the internet. So I definitely don't think there's any reason to be scared and again the benefit to you is once you overcome that part it's now so easy when you get into a real airplane if that's your interest i'm an airline pilot i started simming around the same time i started flying the two have always been intertwined for me and like i said one of the first times that i talked to air traffic control my flight instructors like hey how do you know this stuff like how, how can you do that right like the flight instructors that we typically see they would never imagine a student who's able to jump in an airplane and talk to atc for the first time couldn't fly the airplane I mean, my hands and feet skills were terrible <laughs> you know my landing was awful but i was able to talk to ATC. And I think, again, if you've been on VATSIM and you've had that experience, when you choose to jump into a real airplane, even if it's just for a scenic flight or an intro flight, which I encourage everyone to do because it's an awesome, awesome experience if you have the chance. When you do jump into that real airplane, everything becomes so much easier because you've done it before. Definitely. Yeah. I like how you said, do your homework. And yeah, there's not really very many excuses to do it anymore. Uh, there's YouTube. Aviation Pro, I think, is the YouTube. Yep. Uh, he does a lot of that sim content. And really, it's it's all open source. The FAA isn't usually charging you to read the <laughs> FAA, right. the FAR. Now it's the CFI, or CFR. <laughs> uh, the regulations, they're online. It's a PDF. You can refer to it. Um, you can refer to phraseology websites. There's tons of stuff online for free uh, that you can look into. Yeah, and if you have like a friend in flight sim, you know, someone who you've met through a community or a Discord or whatever, and they're on VATSIM, like that's an amazing way to learn. So for me, uh, almost every time I learn something new for VATSIM, these days it's typically like a new procedure for air traffic control or a new controlling software client, like we learned with ERAM a couple of years ago. I mean, I'm really bad, to be honest, I should be, I shouldn't admit this, but I'm really bad about <laughs> reading. Like I, I hate to just like take a long PDF that's like, 500 pages that explains how to use something and then like have to go through that and learn it myself. So I was actually probably not following my own advice when I was <laughs> learning how to use this new controller software a few years ago. I just went to my friend who was already using it. I'm like, hey, can, can you just like do this with me? And he's like, yeah, man. Like, so we just set up a screen share and for the first like three hours of controlling, he and I just sat down together and he's watching my screen. And he's like, do this, do this, do this. And it was awesome. And I just didn't have to do anything because he just did it for yeah. me. So if you have a friend who's like already in flight sim or already on VAT sim, and you can work with them, that's an amazing way to do it. And we see that on the network. Like lots of times someone will call me up when I'm controlling and say, you know, hey, it's American 5. Just so you know, the guy behind me, American 3, he's brand new to the community. I'm trying to help him out, you know, just go easy on him. I'm like, oh yeah, thanks for letting me know. And then that's exactly what I'll do. And I'll try to make things really easy for them. And I'll often reach out and say, hey, if you have questions, like, let me know. And so I think if, if you know, you're someone who's new and you have a friend who's on VATS and that's a great way to learn. And if you are a VATS, a member and you are someone who's proficient i mean there's lots of people who will put their hand up and help and there's lots of organizations that do that kind of thing so we do it at boston virtual artcc you can check out our website for some of the re uh, reading materials and learning resources like our wings over new england training program there's vat star v-a-t-s-t-a-r that has a real person-to-person -person flight instructor situation so you can actually get flight simulation training and then there's places that you can do uh, you can actually go to find that paid so flight sim coach does coaching training there's a group called community aviation that does like real flight instructors from their home will sit down with you and you can actually do a zoom call and you can learn this stuff so if you want to go the paid route those options exist as well but honestly i think VATSTAR is a great place if you're someone who likes to learn from others and you don't know anybody on VATSIM, that might be a really good place to get started i haven't heard a lot of those before so I definitely will leave those in the show notes. You can go to them at captainbobsim.com slash 10. Again, that's captainbobsim, S-I-M, not S-I-N, uh, dot com slash 10. Uh, apparently, people have been messing that up. 
but uh, go up I to... I get that all the time, too, <laughs> when I'm trying to give people, like, I, we talk to vendors for the show who yeah. like, don't know anything about Flight Sim, and I'm like, it's Flight Sim Expo, and like, Sin Expo? I'm like, no, like, <laughs> who's holding a Sin Expo? Like, what would that even be? No, like... Yeah, yeah I get that a lot. It's hilarious. Yeah. You fly on Batson, right, Trevor? What? I have flown you on fly Batson. Batson, right? I don't Good. currently... Uh, I really Uh-oh. should because my my you radio's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Come come fly while I'm controlling Boston and I'll make fun of you. Okay. Yeah. Feel free to do that. <laughs> make fun of my landing, so I'll be super self conscious. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, if, if it helps, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, we don't get a great view of your landings anyway because oh. we're just looking at the radar. <laughs> so as long as you're like somewhere around the runway, you, you're probably fine. Okay. Great. Uh, I'll put on the in- invisibility cloak livery. I, I'll yeah, have to design that. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be super awesome. Yeah, I definitely will. I haven't done a lot of flying lately in the sim. Uh, I'm doing flight training, which is funny because I've done like flight sim until now when I think it would be most helpful. Uh, but right now I'm just building. I have a bunch of like uh, simulator parts scattered everywhere. Uh, yeah. I really need to get back on the simulation like flying part of it i think that's a big part of it <laughs> not just i talked to so many people like you who build home cockpits mm-hmm. you know whether it be for like general aviation or guys who built like full-on airliner like 737 sims we had uh, tony wilco on fsa a couple of months ago who was like talking through how he built this like literally 737 like full-scale cockpit in his yeah. house and that's what you guys always tell me you're <laughs> like yeah i'm building this thing and i'm like so do you ever fly it and you're like well there's always something broken you know or there's always something <laughs> i'm trying to work on and i'm like yeah i know i get it it's like it's cool because it's its own hobby of like Mm -hmm. building and putting everything together but then the challenge is like you're always finding something that you want to fix and obviously that can get in the way so you're not alone there yeah it's it's funny michael schultz from uh mikey's flight deck he always says that flight simulation building like that is more more uh train modeling than like video game flying (laughs) flight simulator flying and i kind of agree with that I hear you. But, you know, you're right that the sim stuff is super helpful. I mean, for me, that was like all the way through my training, private, commercial, instrument. And even now, when I go back to recurrent training at the airlines, I have gotten into the Embraer 175 in P3D. And I don't really fly it because like that's not what the simulator really helps you with. And we basically don't fly in airline yeah. training anyway. We like get to 400 feet and then something breaks and you come back <laughs> in the simulator. So we don't do a whole lot of flying, but mm-hmm. I do sit there and like, here's where everything is in the cockpit and I'll actually go through the flows. And it's just the difference between like sitting there and looking at a poster where you're like, yeah, you can like put your hand up against the yeah. button, but nothing happens. Or you can actually turn the switch and you can see what the resulting actions are from turning that switch. And I found that to be super helpful and then of course all the other stuff i mean the radio communications the approach knowledge the holds like anything instrument flying at all super helpful to do in the in the sim mm-hmm. yeah but we know that already we all know that <laughs> yeah uh my f- my first flight instructor uh and i've had more than one now which is my friend has had like five flight instructors which i think is hilarious oh. like oh that's bad uh yeah <laughs> like oh but uh, he did he did like two hours when I was beginning flight training uh, in the simulator, and it was very clear that it wasn't to learn how to fly; it was to learn like flows and, or mm-hmm. not necessarily flows, but like how everything works and just what to do instead of like feeling where your feet go. So yeah, yeah, uh, definitely, it does help to click the switches. <laughs> even like the real the airliner sims that we fly for work and these are like the full on level D full mm-hmm. motion you know all that stuff they don't fly like the real plane like yeah. nothing ever flies like a plane except an actual plane <laughs> and so you know, we do learn all the stuff we do take off some landings in the simulators but till you actually get in the real airplane even at the airlines you're never actually feeling the correct full on exact thing at least that's been my experience and the experience of people that I talk to so it's all about procedures it's all about communication and again when you're doing stuff on VATSIM it's about you know actually getting the approach chart out looking at it briefing it programming the airplane stuff that you are going to experience exactly the same as you would in the airplane that's what it's valuable. That's what it's valuable for. Obviously, the hands and feet part. You know, even the big, big boy simulators that we use at work, <laughs> those don't do a great job of replicating how an airplane takes off and lands. Definitely. 
Yeah, I think that's a something that we can all agree on. Uh, some a lot of us don't can't agree if like building simulators or flying them is cooler. But I think we can all agree that uh, flight simulators aren't exactly perfect, but they are helpful. So yeah, that's yeah. like one place we overlap. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. Was how you got started in aviation different at all from how you got started in flight simulation? Uh, I think you touched on that, but um, was flight simulation kind of a factor in your career? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a huge factor all the way through. I was flying as a private pilot back in about 2012, and at the time, I was working in an office job, making a lot more money than I make now at the airlines, but it was definitely a lot less fun. And I remember I was given a project where I looked over this small airport, and so I, was, I wasn't working on the airport or anything, just happened to be out my window. And so I would be at the office, and literally I'm like looking at airplanes take off and land. So that was one big factor. The second big factor was the community at Boston Virtual Air TCC, which again, has basically been a part of my life now since I was an, a teenager, like age basically and so that community you know i was watching people there who were getting their commercial licenses and going to the airlines were thinking about the airlines and so those two things kind of came together for me in 2012 i quit my job moved across the country got my commercial license and then basically never looked back i flew a few years at a navajo and king air operator doing all kinds of really fun stuff gravel strips and international flying in the king air we would take that across the border to and from canada and the u.s we used to go to these really small little airports and sometimes you were like calculating runway length down to a few feet. So it was a lot of fun. And then from there, was able to move on to uh, an operator that flies the Embraer 175 and flight sim and the community around it. I, I don't think there's any chance I would be at the airlines today had I not been so invested in this. It, it just feels at this point like it's another part of my life. And sometimes when you get like super frustrated, and especially with how COVID has impacted our events and how yeah. Flight Simulation Association has come to be with all the stuff that's been going on in the past two years, every now and again, I kind of think like, oh, like I'm, I'm you know, tired of this hobby in the sense that it's just like taking up so much time. And every time I think that, I'm like, yeah, but I can't, like, what, what would I do if I, if I left? Like, all my friends are here. I hang out all the time doing stuff like this. Where would I be doing otherwise? So it's, like, completely a part of my life right now. I, for, for better or for worse, some days it feels like. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so so that's super cool. Um, And I think it's a super cool story that you kind of, like, looked out of the your job watching airplanes take off and land. I think yep. it's kind of funny though because my work is over a little bit by an airport and so maybe maybe i'll have a similar story <laughs> yeah maybe it's gonna happen to you as well you're gonna leave the electrical engineering dream and go and fly to the <laughs> airlines like we all do yeah maybe i don't know <laughs> yeah. i would never have expected it in high school never have expected it in college and then it honestly it just kind of happened and i'm you know even with covid and even with uh, everything that's been going on in the past two years in the industry i think i'm still very happy with the choice that i made but it was like it was a lot i mean people you know people yeah. i worked with were like you're hold on you're quitting to do what now like you're, you're going to become an airline pilot like what <laughs> you know so that was kind of a kind of a fun experience but yeah I, i'm very happy that it, it's given me a lot of time to be able to do flights and expo flights and association mm -hmm. stuff like that and honestly i mean it's it's an interesting career it's not for everybody for sure there's a lot of downsides but it's also a lot of fun yeah and i think it's cool also with that story uh that you did it so late a lot of people are like well i i'm not a teenager yeah. anymore i can't do that but i think that's cool how you did that yeah i think the industry is really in a place right now where you can and mm -hmm. you know it's not just the airlines right if you want to fly professionally there's flight instructing there's helicopter stuff there's firefighting there's corporate aviation I mean, you could list like hundreds of jobs that kind of qualify as commercial pilots so if you're you know in your 40s or your 50s or your 60s and you're thinking you know i want to go get a pilot's license i know people who are doing that i know what they're thinking of their career path and those are all totally possibilities and i think you know you're right like maybe 20 years ago something like that to say that at uh, you know late 20s or 30s you wanted to go to the airlines yeah that would be pretty tough people mm -hmm. did it but there weren't that many nowadays you know because of this pilot shortage we have going on which has only been exacerbated by covid in the last couple of years i think anyone almost has the opportunity if they wanted to to get to the airlines and have a career there which is you know, something that you would never never have thought could happen 20 years ago yeah 
let me adjust the volume real quick before we get to our next topic. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, yeah, with your new job, definitely, uh, uh, I can start that out because I'm going to edit this part out anyways. <laughs> sure. Beautiful. Uh, but with, oh, that's fun. Uh, the water, like, did this. Never mind. <laughs> I get distracted. Sorry, I'll easily. just. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm back. I'm also, ready. I love your T-shirt. <laughs> oh, you like this? Yeah. yeah. That's the Flight Sim Expo shirt from 2019, by oh, the way. Nice. <laughs> yeah. We have a good one this year also. I can't tell you what it is, oh, but good. it's funny. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, oh, exactly. okay. Will it be red, though? Uh, no, I think it's oh. on a black. I think it's on a gray or a black background this year, black T-shirt. Yeah, why would it be red? Just because of the Expo colors? Or? Yeah. I'll have to redact yeah, no. the color oh. choices before the expo. Don't worry, I'll, I have insider information now. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think the so this was the this light blue color that we did, which I like this color by the way. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of not a lot of people, like three people at the event were like, "Why did you pick blue?" I'm like, "Cause it's sky blue. It looks nice. Yeah, I think it's a good color." But we got a lot of people that were like, "No, it's it's weird that it's like a light blue." So now we're going back to a very boring dull gray. It's like the uh -huh. color of the Discord background. Gotcha. Oh yeah. yeah there you go. That color, kind of. That's cool. Yeah. So now you can. There's there's your insider information for today. <laughs> Big bombshell news. Oh, this will go on twenty news sites, CNN, I'm sure. Wall Street, yeah, all of the big ones. <laughs> I'm sure. Flight sim T-shirt color released, leaked. <laughs> Must. See. Yeah, leaked exactly. Yeah, with <laughs> like design previews. Someone's gonna make a fake design or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll make one and put it in the show notes. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> uh, great. So uh, while we're on the topic of Flight Sim Expo t-shirts, uh, I would, I just would like to say what Flight Sim Expo is. So what is Flight Sim Expo? Yeah, well, what I mean, I might throw that, I might throw that question back at you if that's okay. Cause okay. It's always fun to hear what media partners <laughs> and people who've kind of worked on the show think of it. So why don't you tell me what you think of Flight Sim Expo or what you tell me what Flight Sim Expo is, and then I will see how well you do, and I will grade you on it. Oh, no. I'll give you. I'll give you thirty seconds. See thirty how well seconds. You can describe it. Thirty seconds to think, or thirty seconds to describe. No, it's to, to actually oh, no. do it. You, have, you can take up to thirty seconds, and okay. your time is going to start now. Okay, I'll just do it on the spot. So, Flight Sim yeah. Expo is a conference that's held in wherever it wants to be, basically, but it's where a bunch of flight simulator enthusiasts all fly to one place and uh, and sit together. They hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Am I pretty close? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, not, that's not bad at all. You, that was only at like 20 seconds. Okay, so, you, you so I have 10, 10 more seconds, seconds if you want. Okay, so you can try out controls, uh, do stuff like that. You see exhibitors, listen to speeches, and just hang out and meet each other. Really collaborate. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. Excellent. You can put in the, like when you edit this, you can put thunderous applause right here. Okay, right to put yourself, here. okay? Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that was great. Yeah, you, you, you got it. So Flight Sim Expo, North America's uh, largest and I think maybe the world's only flight simulation conference this year with everything that's going on. And exactly what you said, the opportunity to meet flight sim developers, to come out and try different hardware, virtual reality, learn from people who are experts in flight sim, including yourself, who are doing a talk <laughs> about the subjects that they know about, hear new product announcements, Thrustmaster is revealing something, X-Plane is going to be sharing some more previews, screenshots, and I think probably even some more in what they're calling their next generation flight simulator that I'm not allowed to say is X-Plane 12, because it's definitely not X-Plane 12, right? And, <laughs> uh, and a bunch of other stuff like that. So that's what it's about. A great opportunity to hang out and talk flight sim. And if you're someone who, you know, there's lots of people out there, I'm one of them, who's kind of like an introvert and you don't really tell your real world friends about about flight sim because it's kind of like this weird hobby right like that's everyone at the show so literally you can walk around and everyone there is just like you it's so easy to find other people and friends to hang out with to grab dinner with it's just a really cool experience that in my mind you just can't get anywhere else because you know i, I don't know about you but like no one else in my real life <laughs> my girlfriend included knows anything about flight sim or cares anything about flight sim and she's a pilot and she's like yeah your, your flight sim stuff is weird <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious yeah yeah i, I think know. i gotta work on that <laughs> but, yeah <laughs> that's a really good point uh you get to meet best friends that are just like you that's like a army of stormtroopers or clone troopers exactly it's excellent 
Um, and yeah, it's a grand time. What are, let's see, what are some of the reasons that you should go to Flight Sim Expo? Or not you specifically, you're the co-founder, that's a good enough <laughs> Yeah, well, reason. the reason is because I have to be there to run the show, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, I think if you're, if you're an attendee, I, it depends who you are. I think there's a little bit of everything for people at this show. So if you're someone who's brand new to flight simulation, maybe you're thinking about getting started or you're think, thinking about building a flight sim, obviously we've got tutorials, sessions, seminars on how to do that. If you're someone who does flight sim cockpit building like you do, you're going to hear from people who do more of that and get the opportunity to hang out, and much like you might get on YouTube, but it's in person. You're actually able to talk to them and you're able to ask your questions and you're able to share your experiences. And then if you're someone who's just like a really passionate simmer, you'd be able to hear the big news, meet Austin Meyer from X-Plane, meet all the people who make all the products that you like, and of course, just the opportunity to try out flight sim control. So if you're not someone like Trevor who builds his own everything <laughs> and you want someone else to do that for you, there's all the leading flight control manufacturers there. Turtle Beach with their new flight controls. Thrustmaster is announcing a huge new product. I don't even know what it is, but apparently mm-hmm. it's big. Honeycomb is going to have previews of what they have coming up next. So lots of really cool flight sim hardware makers and then a bunch of just indie developers who like Mm -hmm. make stuff in their basement with 3d printers kind of like the way that you guys do and i think that's a really cool thing to be able to see and what are other people doing you can chat with them how did they do that how do they build what they did and then everything in between of course there's the social events where we kind of have a chance to just hang out and relax as a big group we've got captain's corner on friday with a bunch of q a seminars so all the information on what's this event about how you can get there uh, where it is that's all available on the website flight sim expo.com and it's not flight sin expo <laughs> for exactly. the record exactly <laughs> exactly excellent yeah uh that's reason enough uh meet your clone trooper friends <laughs> where are you going uh i'm going oh well i wanted to go because well, you have to talk obviously I have to... <laughs> you know yeah uh Let's see. I wanted to go. I heard about it. I started like really kind of getting a little more serious into flight simulation, uh, like building, uh, listening to a flight sim expo conference. Uh, so on the YouTube channel, uh, it was like oh, really? an hour long one. It was from uh, the Heli Simmer. Sergio? Oh, Sergio. Sergio. Yeah. So it yeah. was his. It was about f- helicopters, and I just remember listening in that room over there. Uh, I'll put a picture of the door in the show notes. No, I won't. Uh, but <laughs> gotta put them in everything. But I remember just listening on my laptop while like soldering something up, and I was like, "Flight Sim Expo, that's pretty cool." Uh, and it both, I think, was pretty cool with my flight simulation hobby, because I learned a ton of cool stuff on the seminars on the YouTube channel. Um, and I also was like, "This is pretty cool." So it kind of that just sparked it a little bit. And then the next year. I heard it, I wanted to go, and then it canceled, uh, and then this year, I was like, I want to do this, I want to meet with, like, I did it a little bit for networking, to, like, meet some of the yeah. players in the flight simulation industry, uh, I wanted to go in person, uh, you, you see the, like, website, and I want to try, I'm very hands-on, so I guess I want to get my hands on, like, all the yokes and stuff, uh, and, like, talk with people. Yeah. Uh, for sure. And virtual reality, I mean, that, the first time I've ever tried it, and actually one of the only times I've ever tried mm-hmm. it, has been at this show a few times in a year now, a few, few years in a row now. So being able to go, and if you've never actually kind of experienced virtual reality before, because it is not for everybody, and <laughs> obviously if you're someone who has like built a home cockpit, then, you know, VR may not make the most sense for you because you're like, well, how do I actually touch this button if I'm in VR? Yeah. So being able to just like try it, I mean, it's such a cool experience. It's such a different way to see flight sim. And I think that's really neat. The other thing is, you know, all the developers, obviously, they're bringing flight sim setups. So like where else in the world can you go and you can try like 30 different flight sim setups in an hour? I mean, that's just something that you don't get anywhere. You can't go to Walmart and be like, I want to try the Thrustmaster yoke. And then I want to compare that to another, you know, <laughs> um, 
another maybe stick that is coming out from another company that I can't talk about. Um, you can't <laughs> actually do that anywhere, right? Other than a show like this. So I think that kind of stuff is really cool for those who feel comfortable coming in person. And I know we've got, you know, this COVID thing is, is by all means not done with us yet. And so that is a challenge for some people. Uh, for those who are coming, it's in San Diego, it's September 24th to 26th. And you can register to come out in person and join us at the show. But for those who don't feel like, you know, this is the kind of thing that you want to do right now, which is totally reasonable. We also have access for people to come and join in the show online. So if you're not feeling like you want to actually make the trip to San Diego, you can support the show. You can hang out and watch all those seminars, more than 30 of them. You get access to Whova, which is an app that we all use to talk while we're on the show site where you can chat with developers, other attendees, access to show specials, discounts, giveaways, all that stuff for just $15 if you wanted to participate from home. So that's an option this year. And there are several people who are overseas, Sergio being one of them, mm -hmm. who can't physically come to the U.S. for this year's show. They're still presenting as part of the online show. So if you are participating online, you get access to everything that happens on the show site through live streaming, plus all of those people who are speaking at the show from wherever they happen to be in the world. And if you're in, going to actually come into the show in San Diego, obviously you can also access all that online content once you go home and you are ready to actually think about flights again because it is a, a really fun weekend but then i think for me anyway at the end i need like a couple of days where i'm like okay i need to be able to breathe again after <laughs> what that experience was like definitely yeah awesome i forgot what question i asked <laughs> um, <laughs> it was yeah you know i don't know actually what you asked either, but it's okay it was a good it's one. okay we got to we got to talk about the show it's fine yeah i learned a lot fine. it's funny that That's just good. proves i'm listening because i'm listening so uh good at the words that i Everything else just whoof. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, he, yeah, you asked me something about like, well, I think I threw it back to you and I said, why did you come to the yeah. show? So I'm guessing you asked me, why should people come to the show? I think oh, that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to go with that one. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, look at that. We got this little section of the podcast all recorded and ready to go with minimal injury. That's always what we're looking for at the Captain Bob Flight Sim Podcast. Again, if you'd like to view the show notes, they are captainbobsim.com slash 10. You can also go to captainbobsim.com slash 11. It'll forward you to the 10 uh, because this is a two-part series. To watch the second part of this episode, go through the exact way you got to the podcast and then just go one further. I believe in you. Hello and welcome to the Captain Bob Flight Sim Podcast. This is episode two of a two-part series with Evan Reiter, the co-founder of Flight Sim Expo. If you want to, if you haven't already, go ahead and get the first part of this episode, episode 10, uh, and I'll meet you back here. Great. Ready? Let's go. Um, okay. So this one is going a little bit more into building Flight Sim Expo. Uh, so... How did you kind of introduce it into the world? Well, what's kind of the story of it? Yes, yeah, so it's kind of funny. It's Flight Sim Expo is run by myself and then uh, co-founder Phil, who lives in the United States. And so the two of us together, we kind of like to just laugh about the fact that we basically have no skills whatsoever. Like we <laughs> don't make flights mad ons. We don't make content. We don't do live streaming. We, I mean, we have a YouTube channel, yeah. but it's like for everyone else who's actually at the show. Our only job is to just try to bring people together, most of which involves me pestering people on Discord and text message and phone call <laughs> and email until they say, yes, I'll actually come to the show. So... This all got started really because we were involved in a previous version of a similar event and it was like, you know what? we're all flight simmers, we're all friends, why have we not had a get together? So the very first one of these, which was like in 2013 or something like that, is a long time ago now, it was just a get together of a few friends that was organized by a sort of mutual friend of ours. And from there it grew into, well, why don't we have some developers come out because they might be able to show some products and stuff like that. And it grew and it grew into what you see today, which has been amazing for us to see. We had almost 1,700 people come out to the show in Orlando in 2019, which was phenomenal. We know this year is going to be a little bit quieter in person because of COVID and everything mm -hmm. else, but still just a tremendous amount of support from developers and from attendees across the community uh, for this year's show, which is just amazing for us to see. So for two people that basically don't have any flight sim skill, all we're trying to do is just give people the opportunity to come together and connect. So if you're a developer who makes something for flight sim, if you're a cool person who has a YouTube channel like you are, mm -hmm. if you're somebody who doesn't have a YouTube channel, but you built something really cool, um, you know, this 
this is a great opportunity for you to basically to take the stage with the flight sim community watching and share that and give back a little bit. I mean, of course, in addition to the people I've just talked about, we also try to reach the real world you know, audience. So if you're a pilot who doesn't know anything about flight sim, great, they'll come to the show. You're going to learn if you're a flight simmer that the same version of prepared that we have on our home computers is used by the Air Force in training and is used by the National Transportation Safety Board in aircraft accident investigations. We've got an investigator coming to the actually virtual show presenting from Washington, and he's going to talk about how they use P3D and other sim platforms to recreate the miracle on the Hudson flight as part of that accident investigation. We've got someone from the Air Force coming in to talk about how almost every fighter pilot in the United States, they fly P3D before they can go into a real airplane. I bet most flight simmers don't know that stuff. And this is the kind of thing where, I mean, you know, the Air Force is not really going to be talking about that on a YouTube video, but they will be talking about that at the show and you'll be able to be part of it if you want to be. Absolutely. So yeah, that was kind of how it got introduced. Uh, and, And yeah, it's super cool. Definitely a cool experience. Um, and what were some of the re- uh, some of the reasons, or like some of the reasons and motivation behind starting it? Really, I think it you know came down to uh, when we started that very very first get together years ago. It was like we have so many you know people in and around the country in all these different places who do flight sim, right? And what if you brought them together? And this was, again, before Twitch, before Discord. And so, you know, you really did have, like, these little pockets in and around the community. And I think we still have that today. You yeah. know, when I talk to folks at Boston Virtual Air TCC, they haven't heard of a lot of stuff that maybe someone at the fly-by-wire Discord is, like, all over. And <laughs> so I think it's really neat when you can kind of bring all that stuff together. I mean, if you're like me and you're in, like, 70 Discords right now, you know, you, there's just no way you can keep up with it all. And so being able to just bring everybody together and have a conversation and meet face-to-face and mm-hmm. talk to developers and talk to other cool people face-to-face, uh, that's really what it was all about from the very beginning, and that was a huge part of why we got this started in the first place. And then Flights and Expo has just grown out of those very humble beginnings into a show that we think is, is a really great thing for the community to be able to take part in once a year. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, oh, and I do want to see this this year and, uh, of course, past years, what have been some of the challenges? I know COVID being one of them. Yeah, I think the biggest one, you know, COVID or not, the biggest one is always that there's this real disconnect in the flight simulation community because we're so fortunate that so much is available for either totally free or mm-hmm. not a whole lot of money. And there's some super high quality payware add-ons that you know people say are way too expensive. Uh, but I mean, so much of what we get, I mean, it's a $60 simulator which itself is amazing value. And then there's so much freeware, there's so much stuff that's available for Mm -hmm. super, super cheap. And so people are kind of like, yeah, you know, I should be able to come to a flight sim show and it should be like five bucks or it should be free. Or, you know, if I'm going to spend 40 bucks, I should get lunch and dinner. And I'm like, hang on a second. The real world does not work that way. (laughs) So for us to live stream the online only event, for example, this year, that's $20,000. For us to have a venue that allows us to put on a show like this, that's a minimum of $75,000 and you have to then pay for things like the audio visual and pay for the food and pay for all the other stuff that goes along with it. And so this, the immense amount of money that like happens in these kinds of things is something that probably most simmers may not understand because it seems like, well, it should be not that much money, you know, 10 or 15 bucks each that should cover it. Uh, But that's just, the numbers don't work that way. And so what we learned as we were doing this show is, you know, if you do this in a very small city somewhere at a single hotel that isn't very big, you know, you can kind of do it for a little bit less money, but we really wanted to try and bring it to cities like Vegas and Orlando and San Diego, places that you'd want to go to on vacation anyway Mm -hmm. and unfortunately there's just like a huge amount of money that goes into that so what's difficult for us as organizers is is to come out to the community and say you know this is why a ticket for flights from expo costs 50 or 60 or 70 dollars it's because we have to go and basically turn that around and live in this real world most of the events that hotels and conference centers see they are like huge corporate events that are put on by companies like microsoft Mm -hmm. that just have like an unlimited budget and so for those events, it would be very common for people to be paying two, three, four, five hundred dollars a ticket. Peer exhibitors to be spending 
three or four thousand dollars just to buy the booth space never mind mm-hmm. all their stuff that goes in it and so uh, that's what hotels are used to and i have to come there and be like look we don't want you know caviar and super fancy entrees i want pizza and beer and let's like you know <laughs> let's hang out and that's a real just difference in what hotels are expecting in terms of big groups and what flight simmers like you and me are kind of expecting when we want to go to a show like this so i would say that's the biggest challenge is just trying to make make all the ends meet when it comes to that disc connect and then of course you know there's just every year even in a non-covid time right we're flight centers so like well if you've never been to a flight sim conference before you Mm -hmm. might be saying like huh well do i want to go to this i'm not going to know anybody uh maybe again like me (laughs) you're kind of an introvert a little bit so you're like i don't know if i'm going to see anybody there that's just that's so not true but you don't know that until you come to a show like this and so that's the other challenge that we face even in normal times is like i kind of say this to phil all the time like people don't want to leave the basement and (laughs) i was like that too for a while Uh, but once i start going to like even just one of these then you just get and you're like okay it's so easy to make friends it's so easy to find stuff to do you're constantly like there's not enough time in a weekend to just do all the things that there are and so i think those are you know a couple things that in normal times are keeping us up and then when it comes to covid i mean just just throw in a huge curveball of uncertainty and everyone's lives have been so impacted by this businesses lives families you know it's it's been an amazing and incredible in a terrible way past Mm -hmm. two years and so uh, that that's just affected us the same as it's basically affected everybody else in terms of making it very difficult to plan. So we've tried to be as responsive to this uncertainty as we can by just offering complete flexibilities. People can register. If they change their minds, they can cancel free of charge. The hotel, if you book that, you can get a full refund up to 48 hours before. Fortunately, right now, almost all the airlines are offering refundable tickets, so that makes mm-hmm. it easy. And we're just telling people, you know, here we are a little bit over a month and a half out. We have every intention of running an in-person show, but we don't know what could happen. California could come in with some new restrictions. We could have a surge in cases even worse than we're seeing right now. You know, nobody really knows what happens in the next couple of days, never mind in the next month and a half. And so what we're doing in the face of all that as uncertainty is just being as completely flexible as possible and saying to the community, if you'd like to come, please come. If you don't want to, you can participate online. And at any point, you can change between those two options Mm -hmm. totally free of charge so that you have the ultimate choice as far as how you want to participate in this year's show yeah excellent and i'll also leave a link to everything so you can come to flight sim expo uh in the description below because i know a lot of us don't like to type in big words uh <laughs> yeah i hardly like to type up like captain bob sim.com and i made it <laughs> so yeah excellent so yeah those were some of the challenges Honestly, I really didn't uh, think about, or I, I thought a little bit about the venue cost, but uh, it doesn't really compare to like Microsoft just throwing money at it. So it's really cool that you can communicate with hotels to let you do stuff like this. And to like, I think I was listening to something else and it was, I think it was another podcast. It was the Flight Sim Community podcast, I think, uh, the episode with you. Uh, but I think it was like, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think it was like, they don't really expect like, like flight sim expos. Those aren't really typical events. So it's no. So yeah. So it's good. No, it's a that. real curveball that we throw at hotels. Like, cause like I said, you know, they're expecting people in suits who are having mm-hmm. a business meeting and who are going to go to the bar with their black Amex and, you know, <laughs> they're going to be ordering $500 bottles of wine. Right. And that's just like, so not the flight simulation community. So we've been really lucky with the hotel partners that we've had. And it's a process. Like I go to typically 15 or 20 hotels a year oh, wow. to be able to plan out which which one of them we're going to go to and we have to tell them like you know people aren't going to pay $200 for a room that's way too expensive we have to tell them they're not going to be buying $500 bottles of wine. You guys need to come up with better pricing for this kind of a group. Mm-hmm. And it's a we make it a very competitive process because if we just went to one hotel and we said that, they'd be like, yeah, right, like I'm going to go and find one of those business shows, right? But we're like, no, no, this is a really cool show. You're going to find lots and lots of people come to this show. It won't be, you know, the 100 business people. It's going to be 2,000 people and you just have to find a way yeah. to work with them. So we work on, you know, really finding the right hotel fit. We can't go 
go to, you know, the Ritz Carlton in downtown Boston. <laughs> we can't go to certain cities even, like totally cities. Like San Francisco is basically off limits. It's just it's too expensive. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't as simmers pay five or six hundred bucks a room and make that be possible. So it takes about, yeah, 15 or 20 hotel visits and many, many back and forths with contracts to talk to those hotel partners. And again, the folks at hotels who get it, they're like, yeah, you know what? This is a really cool show. We're going to have a lot of fun. And we've been, again, very fortunate that in both cases, in Vegas and Orlando, the hotels have said, this was a really fun show to be part of. Like, we loved it. And please come back. And that's what we as show organizers want is for the hotel to be like, that was great for us. We loved it. Uh, Please come back. Because, you know, hey, Flight Sim is really cool, right? Again, if you're a a hotel and, you know, most of the events you do are people sitting in a room, to be able to walk into your ballroom (laughs) and there's like 30 Flight Sim setups there and virtual reality headsets, most of them are like, yeah, this is pretty cool. What would you say the heart of Flight Sim Expo is? It's always been the community. It's always been the folks who come to support the show, the developers who are there on site, people like you who help us promote the show on your YouTube channels. Again, this this show, we call it North America's Community Driven Flight Simulation Conference. And we mean that. People vote on where are we going to have the next show. In 2020, when we had to cancel the show, people voted on that. And we've always tried to be as responsive as we can to feedback and different ideas from across the community. And so that's, to me, what the heart of this show is. As I said before, Phil and I don't have any skills. You know, We don't make <laughs> flights and add-ons. We're not going to give you uh, some magical tweak that's going to give you great FPS performance in your simulator. All we can do is say to people, we're putting on the show. Please come. It's going to be a lot of fun. And those people who come, they make the experience what it actually turns out to be. The chance to meet with people face-to-face when you can, coming in person. The chance to hear from these really, really unique personalities who you might never have thought were doing anything in Flight Sim, which you can now do this year from home. Those are the kinds of things that, to me, keep this event flowing and keep us moving forward, especially in what has been a very tough two years for us as a company. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. The heart of Flight Sim Expo is a community, and I thought I have proof of this because uh, I like wrote a little feedback suggestion, and I think it was Phil. He got back to me and was like, "Oh, that's a great idea. We'll put it on the list." And I was like, "Oh, yep. that's pretty cool." Like I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I was like, "I just expected it to go into the void of space forever." <laughs> <laughs> no, we really. I mean, we really do try to listen to every piece of feedback. I think. Sometimes I get myself in trouble because I think sometimes people just like send in an email with like a suggestion and I always like respond and I'm like, well, this, this, and this. And sometimes I think they're like, dude, I was just suggesting this, but <laughs> it's, I'm asking questions because I, I want to know, or because, you know, you might be suggesting something that we've thought of and we're like, well, here's why we can't do it. And I'm hoping that you might come back and say, but here's another way that you could do it. Right. And mm-hmm. so that conversation that we can have via email or via phone call, or in the case of the show, actually talking face to face that's just huge for us as the organizers of this kind of show i uh, you've probably seen it on your channel maybe maybe you've been Mm -hmm. fortunate enough not to but uh, recently especially i've just seen like a tremendous amount of really tough like difficult comments that i feel like people maybe don't think about what they're writing before they click that send button and often on youtube videos or on facebook like a developer will post something and somebody will just write something that's just like mean and i'm like you know i I know the person that they're sending that comment to like i've met them many Yeah. times and i'm just like I, I can't believe someone would say that to somebody else right i'm sure you've experienced that unfortunately we all have in the past two years especially and so for me like when people actually take the time to send me an email or to reach out to me directly and have a conversation not just like post a comment somewhere i'm going to take that seriously because that's mm-hmm. super super important to me and it helps because how else am i going to know unless people take that time to share what they're thinking uh let's kind of transition into the Flight Sim Association. Uh, What kind of prompted you to make it? This really came out of the show itself, actually. So in 2019 in Orlando, we had people who said to us, we loved the show, it was a lot of fun, but now I'm going back to Chicago. And I would love to keep this experience of hanging out with people going throughout the year. And obviously there's discords and there's individual communities that lots of people are part of. But, you know, if you just want to see if your neighbor is into flight sim, 
you do have no way of doing that. And so we thought, could we build this thing that kind of goes alongside Flight Sim Expo that gives us the opportunity to keep the show going throughout the year? And that was really the impetus for creating Flight Simulation mm -hmm. Association, a place that we could do some outreach to new people to bring them into our hobby, a place where we could offer experience simulators, some discounts on some of the products that they like from top developers, a place where we could do these cross community panels like we did a couple of weeks ago yeah. where we bring six or seven developers together and then a few more in the text chat and we kind of have a conversation a couple times a year and a place where actually the only place where you can actually go and look, are there any other flight simmers nearby using this thing called Simmer Search where uh, we you know, make sure we build in all the safety precautions, obviously, but you can if you, if you choose to, you can opt in to be part of this database and then you can look around and basically say, okay, you know, who else is nearby? And it just tells you if they're within like 20 or 30 miles of you and you have the option if you want to basically email them. So whether that becomes like a potential like little flight sim club that you could set up, yeah. which there's already a couple of that exist around the US and around the world, or whether that's just a Zoom call or hanging out, we've seen people kind of getting together, you know, as close to in-person as we can over the past uh, several years through this association that we've been able to launch. It's flightsimassociation.com. It's free to join. And by joining for free, you get access to a couple of product discounts. All of those webinars that I mentioned, you can go back and watch the recordings and we'll continue to be publishing new ones once the show is over. You can also help us be able to continue to grow the association by joining as an FSA captain for just $3 a month or $30 a year. And what we do with that money is we try to take that back into the flight sim community. So for those people who've become FSA captains, we've taken that money, we put it back into things like Facebook advertising or advertisements with real world organizations like the AOPA and the EAA who are all about like real flying. And we say, hey, you know, if you're someone who's been thinking about getting started in home flight simulation, we can help you with that. So for those people specifically, we have guides, resources, we do individual one-on-one -on -one coaching calls where we can say like, you know, you're starting flight sim for the first time, here are the things to look at, here are the things to be careful with. We've also partnered with some organizations that do much of the same thing. And we're really just trying to say, look, if you are someone who's been thinking about flight sim, get out of your own way and just start because mm -hmm. I don't know about you. I mean, I told my story. You can, maybe you can tell me your story, but I think for most of us, we kind of got into flight sim by accident and our first setup, I mean, mine was a computer with a mouse and a joystick. Yeah. And over time I kind of figured out what should that be? And I bought stuff and I figured out who were the best uh, companies to buy add-ons from and what were the places to maybe avoid. And so we thought, could we just find a way to make that a little bit easier for people? And that was really what, what flight simulation association was designed to do. And, so far, we think we're having an impact. We want to continue to build that and grow that. We want to give developers the opportunity to come together with these panel discussions and just do you know interesting stuff that right now we don't think anyone else in Flight Sim is doing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I just prompt them to join. I joined because my cousin, he flew Flight Sim uh, just every once in a while, and I'd come along on flights with him. In the 747, it was always domestic, uh, which they almost never fly, but it was awesome. Uh, we always picked the best library, the World Trade Airlines. Oh, yeah, that, that one. Yeah. Uh, on I liked FSX. Orbit myself. I got to say that blue and the orange was nice. It was pretty nice. I like that one. Just not Pacifica, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was like all green and stuff. But yeah, uh, but yeah it's been it's really important to like grab them in. Uh, something I did want to ask was uh are the recordings of the speakers this year being uh put anywhere once they're done yeah so for this is for flights from expo yes. so all of those uh talks they'll be available to people who've purchased the online only flights max registration probably for a couple of months and then uh, once that period is up i think we're probably going to put them on our youtube channel we haven't you know full-on decided that part of it yet uh, but i think they should go to youtube because mm. obviously as you pointed out you know there's some really interesting stuff that's hanging around in our youtube channel so i think that's probably what we'll do with them but i can't say for sure what's going to happen we really haven't mm. uh, haven't had that part of the conversation yet but for sure at least for a period of a couple months uh, we'll be asking people to just help support the cost of the show for $15 if they wanted mm -hmm. to watch those. And that helps us defray the $20,000 worth of cost <laughs> for live streaming the show. Definitely. Uh, and yeah, what's uh, what are some of the things that you could, that, uh, what are some of the things that you get over the, the videos from getting the, in per, uh, the live 
webinar. <laughs> that was a bad question. Do you want question. to try that one again? <laughs> I'm like, uh, um, okay. <laughs> Take three. <laughs> what are some Give of the second. things? Okay, I'm ready. I'm, right, I'm okay. ready. What are some of the things that you can gain attending virtually uh, instead? Or what are some of the things that would motivate you to attend virtually? So if you're looking to attend Lights and Expos, online-only registration, what you're probably looking at is the opportunity to participate in those seminars. We've got product announcements coming from about 10 different developers, everyone from hardware to software to simulation design, and the only place you'll be able to see those is if you've actually registered to take part in the show. As a Flights and Expo online-only attendee, you're also getting access to product discounts, giveaways, and the ability to have a live chat with all of the developers who are participating in the show, both on site and virtually. So you'll be able to go to their profile in our app called Whova. You'll be able to chat with them. You'll be able to chat with other attendees. And as I said, you know, it's this opportunity for us to kind of come together. We intentionally didn't make a Discord, and the reason is because we wanted to make it different than what's already there. You know, everyone has, in my case, like I said before, you know, mm. I have a ton of Discord community. <laughs> so as soon as I start to join a new one, it's like I have to mute it because there's so much activity yeah. going on. With the Whova app, you're basically taking all those people, a couple people from all those discords and bringing them together in one place for the course of a couple of days. And so it's just a really interesting place to take part in conversations that you might see that are a little different from what you've been doing over the course of just the regular year and the live streams that you may be watching on Twitter which are on YouTube on a regular basis. So beyond anything else, that's what you get with a Flight to Mexico online-only registration. Definitely. And I would think it's worth it uh, just for the live component of it, being able to like ask live questions and be, ga be engaged in it uh, real time. I think that would definitely uh, make it worth it. I yeah, said. for sure. I mean, of course, everything, you know, is recorded, but I, for me, I'm like, you know, when something is recorded, I don't know, it doesn't have that same appeal. Yeah. I like to be part of it live and to be asking the questions or just watching, like, what are other people saying? What are other people commenting on? And I think that's what's, you know, really what's great about what YouTube and Twitch have been able to do with the chat is like, it's kind of a conversation mm -hmm. now. So that'll be a little bit more difficult for the on-site you know, speakers, because they're going to be talking to a real audience. But for people who are actually participating online, like you'll be able to chat with each other. So you can actually say, you know, if X plane is announcing something new, and you're watching it, you can actually have a conversation of like, hey, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And again, you're just taking people from all those little parts of the community, putting them together in this chat, and having a really interesting discussion on the side mm -hmm. of whatever's being announced. Definitely. So yeah, the community chat really uh, makes it awesome. And some of the community and I'd they say, I'd probably say that the community chat is also one of the reasons to join the Flight Sim Association uh, with the webinars. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so Flight Sim Association, we team, aim to do about two to three webinars per month. Some of those are big cross-community panel discussions, like the one we did on July 24th, where we bring together a bunch of developers, we have a bunch of giveaways, and we kind of say, let's talk about something that's interesting in our community. So the most recent one was around the launch of Xbox and how that might affect how developers are creating products for the simulator. We also do more sort of education oriented seminars. So we go and look for people who are great on virtual reality, who know about 3D printing or who are VATSIM experts. And we say, you know, why don't you come in and talk about that specific subject? And so unlike a live stream where, you know, you might be watching somebody fly, we would say to that somebody who's a Twitch streamer, you know, come in and actually share like a presentation on how to start an airplane from cold and dark or share a presentation on what online aviation is and why you should get involved in it. So all of those webinars are available for you to watch recorded. And then we again do them live a couple of times per month. And as an FSA member, you have the opportunity to take part in the discussion. So as a captain, you have a live chat there where you can communicate with others. As a first officer, you can send in questions and again, Again, you know, how often does Orbix or Aerosoft or other developers, how often do they come out and live stream? Almost never. And so the opportunity for you to go and ask them a question, I mean, yes, you can visit their forums. Many of them have Discord and all the developers are very, very open to feedback. So it's not like it's the only chance mm -hmm. to communicate, but how often do you get to see the CEO of Orbix, whose name is Anna? I think most simmers wouldn't even know that. How often do you get to see her actually answering questions, you know, submitted by people from the community? And that's what we're trying to do with the association is just a couple of times a month and you know a couple of times every two or three months for those bigger ones give us a chance to come together in ways that maybe we don't see on a regular basis absolutely 
Uh, real quick, I do want to, as we're wrapping up, kind of go into some of the technology you're excited about and also some of the technology you think is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a tough time with the second part of that, but <laughs> uh, you know, I'm excited about Xbox. Really, I think it's interesting that we have Flight Simulator on consoles because that's mm. really the first time that it's happened, at least as far as I can tell. Yeah. So I think that's really neat. Uh, seeing what virtual reality is doing for flight simulation, I think if there's one that's overrated, actually, it might be that one, and I can talk about that <laughs> in a few minutes. And then also just seeing all the development that we've kind of come across in the past year since the launch of Microsoft Flight Sim, you know, new development companies that in some cases are freeware, other cases are payware. I think it's really been interesting to see just how much interest and activity there's been around the community. I remember that back, uh, I think in 2018, maybe or 2017, people were kind of saying like Flight Sim is dead, like it's not going anywhere. <laughs> And the year later, we had a new version of X-Plane, a new version of P3D, and even at that time, we had FSX Steam Edition come out. So we were like, uh, yeah, maybe maybe Flight Sim isn't quite so dead. And of course, <laughs> now it's just more active than ever. You know, in the last year, we've had new releases of all three of those platforms, P3D, mm -hmm. V5, X-Plane 11 and a half, and of course, a new Microsoft Flight Sim release. So I think that's all really exciting news for our community. And if there is something that's, I don't know if I want to say overrated, but my best answer <laughs> to like technology that I think isn't quite there yet, I think VR is an amazing experience i do think that give it a couple of years and you're going to have a glove or something like that where when you have the goggles on you'll also be able to interact with like the actual airplane in mm -hmm. the simulator and i think when that happens i'm not going to say that's going to put you cockpit builders out of business <laughs> by any means but i do think you know imagine if all the time and the effort that you've spent on like building you know if instead you didn't have to do that but you could just put on a set of goggles mm -hmm. that'd be a really interesting experience never would like i don't think change the whole like cool hands-on hobby yeah. part of what you do and i think you'd still build home cockpits but like if i could just <laughs> buy you know a set of vr goggles and a glove for like a thousand bucks and i could then be sitting in an embraer 175 cockpit and like use my hand and move stuff mm -hmm. and the next day i could be sitting in a Cessna 172 cockpit and programming yeah. gps with that same glove i mean that would be really cool so i think vr is going in that direction and you know we are seeing that people use it about 12 15 percent of flight simmers use virtual reality mm -hmm. right now i think give it a few years and it's going to be a really popular technology definitely that's cool yeah uh while we while we wrap up, uh, what are <laughs> uh, I will be speaking as we said at Flight Sim Expo. It's at 10 a.m. to 10:40 a.m. as of right now. Uh, the time slot it's in uh, Seminar Room A. It's Saturday morning, uh, so you can look up forward to that or completely avoid it. I um, <laughs> either way, <laughs> you're like you hear me testing the mics and you're like run, uh, but it is up to you. Uh, definitely see if you want to attend that. There are so many cool seminars. I was looking on the schedule page uh, like six months ago, and I'm like, dang, these are cool. Uh, so really, if I'd, I'd recommend attending any of the seminars you want to attend. And yeah, so is there anything you'd like to say, uh, Evan, before we go off air? I think we've covered a lot okay. here. Hopefully people are still watching by the end of this and we haven't gotten them completely bored. Uh, you know, come to the show if you can. And if you can't, please register and do the online only portion. If you've never done something like this before, it is truly unique in flight simulation. I think we are probably the only flight sim show that will happen in 2021, which is a real shame because mm -hmm. I've been to the show in the UK. I've wanted to go to the Netherlands to do that show. They are an amazing experience in person or online only. So flightsimexpo.com is the website. Flightsimassociation.com is the website for our association. And we'd love for you to take part in either or both of those things in any way that you can. And if people have ideas, questions, comments, feedback, uh, feel free to reach me, Evan, at flightsimexpo.com. Send me a message on every possible social media, Discord, TeamSpeak, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I, yeah, anything's fine. Uh, smoke signals probably don't work too well. But other than that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm here and I'd love to hear from the community. If you have thoughts, feedback, ideas, uh, just, just don't post a comment on this YouTube video because I may not see it. Um, mm -hmm. but, but reach me directly, please. I'd love to talk to you. Excellent. And uh, the show notes to this are captainbobsim.com slash 10. I think I'm going to make this a two-part episode. Uh, so is it like 10A, 10B, 10.5? Uh, we'll just put them both under 10. Uh, so go there and uh, you can reach everything we talked about. Probably not everything, uh, but 
a lot of what we'll talk about. And uh, I really look forward to seeing you in the next month's podcast. Have a fantabulous day, and I'll see you in the next episode. Have a good one. Bye.